Incidents of racism are in the news almost every day. In the worst cases, they're deadly, like that of Stefan Clark, who was shot 20 times in his backyard last month after police allegedly mistook his cell phone for a gun. Or nearly deadly, like that of Michigan teenager who was shot at when he tried to ask for directions at a white home. Then there are the other cases that are just plain outrageous, like the two men who refused to leave a Starbucks several days ago and ended up getting arrested for trespassing. And this latest of five women who were trying to enjoy a game of golf at their club, a club they all belonged to, when they were told they were playing too slowly and the situation escalated. Remove yourself from our premises please, please. in the next five minutes, please. please. Sure, because the, authority, the authorities okay. have been called. And police did arrive, and the group was not arrested, but still, really? Golfing while black and the police are cold? Whites, like me, tend to decry these things and then move on. But Boston Globe columnist Renee Graham argues we need to do more and use what she terms white privilege and not just feel guilty about it all, but to do something about it. Is she right? I'm joined now by Shirley Leung, Boston Globe business columnist, GBH contributor, and recently named by Boston Magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in Boston. Congratulations. Thank nice you. to see you, Shirley. Michael Jeffries is a sociologist, American studies professor at Wellesley College. Michael, it's good to see you, too. What's your quick reaction? This Pennsylvania thing totally put me over the edge. What's your reaction to this? Oh, it's awful, and um, especially after the Starbucks incident, yeah. right? And, and what was crazy was that they were members of the club. Yeah. And uh, so you've got to think that there was something else going on, right? Well, I think it's the R word. Is that racism? What's your take on this, Michael? It's the, the thing that's so difficult about it is it doesn't seem like the attention that these other events and incidents get has any immediate impact, right? So like you said it was right after the Starbucks thing, which was a huge national story, right in their backyard and didn't seem to get anything done. Trevor Noah had an explanation. I think it's a pretty good one. Here he is. Black people can't win in America, right? If you advance on white people, you're a threat. If you run away from them, you're suspicious. And now they call the cops on you when you take your time. It's golf. That's what golf is for. <laughs> like, you know what the problem in America is? Is that white people call the police like they're asking for the manager. <laughs> Which I think is exactly... You know, can we step back and talk? Renee, Renee didn't use these words. Renee Graham didn't use these words. But here's my takeaway. It is that there's too much talking by people like me. There's too much guilt by people like me, but not enough doing. Do you think that's an accurate characterization of the state of the world in 2018? Yes, and I love this piece by my colleague Renee mm -hmm. Graham. Um, she said, you know, turn your white privilege, white guilt into action. And it's something that I've also written about too. Um, you know, white men, you know, in this town is dom dominated by white men. Um, you know, instead of excluding them about diversity and inclusion talk, make them the leaders of it. You just wrote and this thing about tourism board and you got action, by the exactly, way. Exactly. No people of color in the finalists. Right. And, and I, I, and, you know, that story, that didn't, that came from, uh, I had white sources. I, because there weren't people of color involved. And so, you be know, white sources who were concerned who about were the concerned fact. Who were concerned and dropped dimes to me. So I'm just Well, saying, they were doing they, what Renee Graham exactly, was Exactly. They were using white privilege. They're white, they were taking their, instead of, you know, using their, their position t for change. You know, at first, when I read this this morning, for, there's a little piece of me that, I wouldn't say bristled, but stepped back. And then I said, I can count on one hand the amount of times in recent days this two Starbucks people, the videographer, or the video person, and the guy who had a meeting with him. I mean, there's so few instances. So she has nailed this, has she not? Absolutely. And, and it's easier, I think, to recall or to worry about those times when there's an incident happening and there's an opportunity, an obvious opportunity for a white bystander or observer to step in and either take a video or ask the police what's going on. But there are other opportunities, more hidden opportunities, yeah. for people to use their white privilege for progressive means that aren't acted upon or recognized like, all the give time. Like, an example. Right? So, for example, I think there are are all kinds of examples in your place of worship or at your workplace or in your home where white families are talking amongst themselves and they let a joke go by or something that's not quite a racist slur go by because, well, it's just my crazy uncle doing it or my crazy coworker doing it. But those opportunities in white spaces, not when there's a near deadly incident, that's not mm -hmm. the only chance you have to use your privilege to interrupt something. Interrupt it when you're among white friends and white colleagues too. That's a chance uh, to make progress yeah, but, yeah, but as well. One of the issues, I don't disagree with that at all, but you know, Surely, it, I don't know where the line is. We talked about this on the radio today that separates welcome ally to unwelcome white 
savior. I mean, one of the reasons the movie Get Out, I think, is so huge, because they're black victims who are actually not rescued by a white person. They're actually rescued by a black person. How do you not stride the line where I'm going to come in and save black people from the crap that they have to live with every day? You know, I'm glad you brought this up, because I recently was on this panel, and I was moderating with Tom Croswell, who is this... Oh, Oh, about race, wasn't I? I just realized. The white CEO of of Tufts Health Plan, and he he came in. He's like a, a, you know, white CEO of Central Casting, you know, and he comes in and he hires a, you know, a VP of business diversity and he does all these things. And I ask him the questions like, uh, do you feel like, how do you, how does it feel like to be a white guy championing, you know, carrying mm-hmm. the flag of diversity? And he said, I said, you know, how do you, how do you be authentic about it? He's like, listen, d- does it make me uncomfortable? Yes. And you have to get uncomfortable. We're, this is an uncomfortable process and white people have to be, get uncomfortable and, and figure it out and talk to a lot of people. But it's going to be an uncomfortable process, but but don't but go there. You know, it's okay. You know, you're nodding in agreement here, but I have to say, first of all, I can't stand the term white privilege, even though I know in a lot. I don't mean because I, I say, how dare they? I mean, it just it gives me the creeps, even though I think mm. it's probably intellectually accurate. But you know, I'm thinking as Shirley's talking, the Parkland kids are celebrated in one forum. And in other forums, we hear, well, the only reason anybody's paying attention to these kids is because for the most part, not exclusive, for the most part, they're rich white kids. They did reach out to people of color, like in mm-hmm. Chicago, etc. But there was a lot of that criticism. Again, they're using their white privilege when they were just really reacting to but what I think happened. The to way that they have sort of turned that story on its head and the efforts that they went to to include voices of color and students from their own school, especially in the march that happened after all yeah. the activism in Parkland, is an example of what's necessary necessary in order to use that privilege for something good. And I think part of what's happening here is, right, if you want to avoid the white savior thing, part of it is uh, you have to get involved and stay involved and not be timid about it. But the other part of it is you have to know when to step back and cede authority to people of color who have been working on these issues long before the white CEO was, right? right? And that's another huge piece of this is stepping back, using your power to step back and give someone else these Well, that was a criticism of the women's march, by the way, long before the gun march, that white leaders were not stepping back for people of color. You know, I want to stay on the white privilege thing just for a second. In an era when there's so much division, and I'm this is not an original thought with me. I read some brilliant pieces about this during the Trump campaign. A guy making fifteen thousand dollars or a woman in Pennsylvania, like your Matt Pfizer wrote that brilliant piece about mm-hmm. Butler, Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. Almost all white, almost right. all vo- the graduating class seventy six, almost all voting for mm-hmm. Trump, not misogynist, not Islamophobes, not racist, mm-hmm. etc. They can't afford to send their kid to college, they can't afford to retire, they can't afford to go on a vacation. When they hear you have to use your white privilege, and maybe they do have a similarly situated black doesn't have what they have. They recoil at that, and shouldn't they recoil at that? They're suffering big time. Maybe not as much, again, as a black or a Latino or an Asian in the same circumstance, but shouldn't they? You mean, what do you mean, suffer? What, I, I don't well, if you're a, a working class white guy right. in Butler, Pennsylvania, right. you're having, you don't want to hear somebody saying, use your white privilege. Well, <laughs> that's probably true that they're not doing that there. But I mean, I think this is more, you know, I, I guess I'm thinking about in Boston. And there are a lot of people, uh, white people uh, who are liberal, who, who want to help. And I feel like there's, uh, there's a lot to be done here. And, and, uh, and Renee Graham's piece really struck Accord, because I think there are a lot of people out there who who don't know what to do, who who um, who are just bystanders and don't realize that bystanders play a huge role. And there needs to be more training, more discussion, more conversation in workplaces everywhere. We only have this. 15 seconds left. How do you enter the discomfort zone that you're both suggesting that we enter? I think there are all kinds of models for it already, but I think it starts with talking with people you're comfortable talking to. Don't always feel like you have to step up and enter this kind of foreign conversation. Start with your siblings. Start with your friends you grew up with. Start with your coworkers. That's a great first step. We've got to go, Shirley. It's great to see you. As always, Michael, pleasure. Thanks for being here. Thank you.